everyone to this uh, CGD event on COVID-19 supply chain resilience and global trade. My name is Prashant Yadav. I'm a senior fellow at CGD. Um, the world needs supply chains and logistics now more than ever. Governments around the world are scrambling to um, contain, manage the spread of COVID-19 and its associated economic fallout and having well-functioning supply chains has emerged as a priority. This was a, a new found area of focus for uh, many public agencies and also uh, a sober reminder to many companies about how to manage their supply chains better. Uh, a lot has happened in the last uh, 11 months or eight to nine months in particular. Um, we've seen the impact that not well-functioning supply chains can have on lives, uh, especially supply chains for medical products. But in addition to the supply chains for medical products, we've seen factories and businesses around the world which have been closed or have faced some other kind of supply disruption where they cannot sell their product to their customers because of air cargo disruptions. Um, other things such as workers not coming to the factory. Uh, in, in some areas, demand is declining or is shifting. People, uh, instead of going to restaurants, are going more to um, retail uh, food establishments. And, and that's changing and shifting the way demand uh, is between different channels. So a confluence of multiple factors, supply-side disruption, demand-side shocks, have put considerable pressure on supply chains. And I think there is a, a realization that, yes, we need better supply chains. We need to think about this in a, in a different way. The same is not true about trade. We know that supply chains depend upon global supply chains, depend upon global trade. But there is uh, an assumption that um, global trade isn't necessarily one-on-one -on -one connected with global supply chains. Uh, so that's something we need to um, highlight and remind people uh, of. And so in to at today's event, we want to cover all of those things. We want to think about the role of supply chains and global trade in the lives that matter um, and making sure that medical and other essential supplies are, are coming to those who need them. But at the same time, also think about livelihoods, uh, the, the vast production networks that many companies have including in um, less developed countries around the world where uh, manufacturing jobs and jobs in other supply systems are a source of livelihood and economic progress are being put at risk. Beyond the immediate response, uh, this is also an area which is important to support the long-term economic recovery that is important to keep in mind. So we've, uh, we are happy, excited, enthusiastic that we have a great panel of global experts in supply chains, trade, import, export, and trade policy. Um, let me start by introducing our experts for this session. We have um, Kim Elliott. She's a non-resident fellow at the Center for Global Development, uh, a, a known expert in the area of trade policy. She has multiple books. Um, has led many initiatives around trade and its impact on, on, on the poor, uh, including in food security, agriculture. Um, and um, in addition to her books, she writes a weekly column in World Politics Review about trade, which I, um, I'm an avid reader of, and, and I usually like the way she describes many of the issues. Uh, so Kim Elliott is our first expert. Then we have uh, Professor Yossi Sheffi from MIT. He's the director of the Center for Transportation Logistics at MIT, a recognized thought leader in the field of supply chain management. Uh, he has written multiple books, including two on supply chain resilience. And his new book, uh, The New Abnormal, came out um, a few weeks ago, which talks about how companies and, and public agencies are handling and managing um, supply chains during COVID-19 and what is the new future state of supply chains going to look like. So um, our next uh, speaker or panelist is uh, Professor Shafi from MIT. Welcome, Professor Shafi. And um, then we have uh, Fred Hochberg. Um, Fred is the former uh, 
chairman and uh, chief executive of the Export-Import Bank of the United States, and in addition to his role at the Exim Bank, he's also been the head of the Small Business Administration and has had many other roles. His uh, book on trade, um, which is a very interesting reading if you want to think about products uh, in your close vicinity that you have you use every day, how do they impact um, trade and, and how trade impacts how much you get, what prices, other things like that. So a, a very approachable way of dis describing global trade. Um, so welcome, Fred Hochberg. Let me start by going to um, Yossi Shafi um, to start. Yossi, um, new book, I, I read The New Abnormal, um, found um, lots of interesting anecdotes, vignettes in there. But um, how are successful companies responding? How are successful state agencies, governments responding? Are, are you seeing something which you would call as exemplary practices in managing supply chains during COVID-19 and beyond? Thank you very much, uh, Prashant. I appreciate the, uh, uh, the introduction. And let me start talking about my book. Uh, because it's an example of exactly what happened. So uh, on October 1, my book, The New Abnormal Reshaping Business and Supply Chain Strategy Beyond COVID-19 was published. In the span of five months, I did the research with small supporting cast of research associates. This, was my, this is our, my sixth book. Each one of them took about four years of research and writing, and then a year from submission of manuscript to publication. This book took five months to write, two weeks to edit, and 48 hours to self-publish on Amazon and now on Google and Apple. Why do I say this? Well, first of all, I'm trying to promote my book, of course, but aside, <laughs> that's not the reason. The reason is this is what happened for companies. They adjusted. They did things so much faster, more flexible, more agile than ever before. People found they can do things in speed in new ways, which did not consider possible before the pandemic. You know, of course, the most amazing thing was the development of the vaccine. Recall we were talking about it takes usually 10 years to develop a vaccine. Develop it in 10 months. Other business also adjusted in multiple ways. You know, food kept running despite the monumental changes. The fact that the institution, university, restaurants, industrial park stopped uh, stop ordering, and people at home change the item that consume, a lot less fresh produce, more cans, more comfort food, yet by and large, the food kept, the food kept coming. And in the book, I describe all the adjustments that, uh, that had to happen. Another thing that happened and uh, has implication to the future is that the importance of supply chain management function was elevated in all organizations. The media started uh, covering supply chain issue like never before. Uh, my wife, who used to be asked what your husband is doing and had trouble explaining supply chain management, doesn't have to explain it anymore. She used to say, my husband does research in supply chain, and people say, what is it? They don't do it anymore. Terms like inventory, transportation, tracking, just in time, you know, became common. The media talked about the failure of supply chains. Let me just make a few points and started calling for the end of just in time, getting out of China. Let me just say that none of this thing is likely to happen at the rate that the media mavens and journalists expect. Um, first of all, the failure of supply chain. Supply chain didn't fail. In fact, it, to quote the Churchill, it was their finest hour. They adjusted so fast. People who were competitors started collaborating. People collaborated across the supply chain and made things happen. We talked about all the changes that happened in food. And sure, once in a while, you didn't have your uh, perfect, the, the, your favorite cut of meat or your favorite uh, uh, granola flavor, uh, flavor, but you didn't have a problem. And, and in fact, what the, what the media was showing, pictures and video of empty shelves, they were always taking just before the store closed at night. They didn't realize if they will come to the same stores in the morning, they'll see full shelves because they didn't understand the cadence and the way supermarkets are being um, fulfilled. So, you know, truck leave the warehouse at night, get in the, uh, late in the evening or um, 
in the wee hours of the morning to the supermarket, people break down the pallet, stock the shelf. So when customer comes, the shelves are full. Then people start talking about the end of just in time. Again, it's not understanding just in time, basically. Uh, just in time is one of the most important innovation in manufacturing supply chain in the last, I don't know how many years. It's basically responsive for creating high quality product at an affordable cost. It's due in large part to low inventory because you don't have, you find a, um, mistakes and flaws immediately because you don't have to work through an inventory pile. And if you have a problem, you cannot take one from the inventory. You have to find out the root of the problem. So this is not going to change it's too much of a competitive advantage. You can run as it turns out just in time with emergency, in, with emergency inventory. But the trick is to make sure that it cannot be used day to day, but um, require high level okay to start using it, just like we ran the strategic petroleum reserve that the companies could not use it for day-to-day -to, -day to manage day-to-day -day fluctuation in prices, for example, but needed, it needed presidential approval in order to release oil from the strategic oil reserve. Finally, the last point I want to make is that uh, the media is talking, this is future looking, the media talks about uh, people going out of China. Now, the truth is that there are few by now Manufacturers are in China due to the low cost and cost arbitrage. You know, production like garment production is moved long ago to Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. Even Chinese manufacturing are moving the last stage of production, the cutting and sewing, to places where low labor costs, which is about one seventh of the cost of in the coast in, around the coast of uh, of China. However, sophisticated manufacturing, take for example, textile. The, uh, uh, the Chinese, so um, there was a big reduction in the number of uh, Finnish garment being exported out of China, but there was comparable increase in, the, in textile being uh, exported out of China because textile requires machinery, capital investment, sophisticated manufacturing, so it's the same that goes with high tech, avionics, uh, uh, automotive manufacturing. All this is likely to stay in China. Another thing that the, the media did not understand is that it's not the final production. There's, in China, there's full ecosystem of supplier and their supplier and their supplier and their supplier that companies built over a decade and for billions of dollars. It's very hard to move out of China. It's very hard to find these capabilities elsewhere. And finally, people have to be in China because it's a large and growing market. Right now, it's the only market that's actually thriving. So it's not likely that uh, companies are going to leave China, at least not at the rate that, uh, that you are thinking. We can, take more, we can talk more about it later in the Q&A, but let me stop here and uh, give the floor back to Prashant. Thanks, Yossi. One quick follow-up question. So one is that, Yes, the media narrative may have sounded like supply chains are failing, shelves are empty, just in time is over, but in a way it's also incumbent on many of us to make sure that the right stories and the right version of this keeps getting out to uh, the, the population that doesn't spend time reading, researching supply chains as you do. So in a way it's incumbent on, on you and many of us to do that. But my question is, um, when we think about investing in supply chain resilience, and you've, you know, you've written about this concept, many of us have actually learned it from you, um, the idea that governments have a role to play has not been as strong in the past. Right? We've assumed companies alone will, will make their supply chain resilient. So what is the extent of realization now that governments have to play a role in making supply chains resilient? And if yes, how? What are the kinds of things that governments should be doing? Okay, let me, uh, I think the, the role of government is in critical national supplies, not in general. Whether we don't have enough toys for kids, that's not the government uh, issue. But let's talk about the most critical one, medical supplies, as an example of what should be done. I think the failure of the medical supply, uh, of the medical supply chain was not a company failure, it was a government failure. Because 
if you look back, the Clinton administration started building up a strategic reserve of PPEs and other medical supplies. The Bush administration built it up significantly, and then the Obama administration let it run down, and Trump administration did nothing. So we got to the situations we got. There are three legs to, uh, to uh, start rebuilding and avoiding the same problem in the future. Leg one, strategic reserve. That's a strategic national reserve, probably kept at um, the five big distributors. But uh, we can talk about the detail how to do it. But one strategic national reserve that keep evolving because these are medical supply. You don't you don't want to let them you know uh, go out of date. So um, that's why I'm saying they should be kept at a distributor. We're going to use them on an on ongoing basis, but keep a level that they cannot go below. That's one thing exactly like the strategic petroleum reserve was, was managed. Level two, hospitals. We have to make sure that as part of the license to operate, hospital have so many weeks, months, whatever we decide the right, uh, the right number is, to hold during a pandemic. Exactly like we did after 2008, 2009, we did stress tests for banks. We now need stress tests for hospitals. As part of the license to operate, hospitals need to be stress tested how they work in a medical disaster. Number three, the other part is missing is personnel. We have cases right now when people are, you know, starting to train people both to, uh, you know, take care of people and to, uh, to administer the vaccine, training people on the fly, getting, asking uh, retired doctors and uh, nurses to come back. We need people. So my last leg is just like we have the Army Reserve, have a medical national reserve and start having people who will be trained and work in a, in a hospital, let's say, one week in the month, and every year come for two, three weeks for retraining, just like they have, we have the military national reserve, we have a medical national reserve with the same glory, the same remuneration, the same way that we do uh, the, uh, uh, the military uh, national reserve. So this is an example now. What is the role? So government has a role in the national uh, area. The government has an auditing role, in fact, in, in, in doing the uh, stress test. And then running the medical national reserve is also a government issue. It can be done state by state, like we do it now. With the, But this is how level of government and the uh, industry can work together to avoid having the disaster, having... I mean, it's really still... You know, it's hard to see even today people working in many hospitals and not have enough supplies and getting infected. It's 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 awful in in the richest country in the world that this is still happening. Anyway, again, let me stop. Thanks, Josie, and and also a very uh, sober reminder that even when in the U.S. with all of the resourcing that our healthcare system has, we have such challenges. Um, you know, when we think about a global medical supply chain, I mean, things tend to get uh, trickier, uh, although in some cases, uh, countries with much limited resources are doing much better. <laughs> so there's also examples uh, or exemplars like that. But let me go to Kim. Kim, when we think about supply chains, you know, we, we oftentimes uh, don't think as actively about trade policy. And we know that, you know, the, the linkage between the two is almost inseparable. So I want to ask two things. One is, in the current COVID um, environment, do you think our trade policy in the U.S. Uh, has hurt our ability to, to manage key supply chains? And secondly, trade restrictions, not just um, things that have happened in the U.S., but trade restrictions and trade preferences across countries. Um, some have you know, created trade embargoes, export bans, import bans, um, you've written about the fact how they hurt the poorest countries and, you know, more so even the, the poorest population segments uh, within less developed countries. So um, as companies will be 
presumably geographically diversifying their supply base after COVID-19 instead of being concentrated in one country. And you'll see, seem to think we, we may not see such a big shift, but assume we see more geographical diversification, companies seeking suppliers in multiple countries. Is there an opportunity, a silver lining out of this to help in economic development by integrating countries which were not as integrated in global trade and and getting a, an economic development benefit out of that? Kim, do we have you? Okay, now can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Prashant. I, uh, first of all, unlike Professor Sheffi, I did not uh, adjust to the pandemic by upgrading my technology. So I apologize that uh, my connection is not good enough for you to all to see me, but I hope you're hearing me okay and that it will be relatively smooth. Um, so thank you for having me. And on the, the questions, first, let me start on the how has trade policy helped or hurt during the um, pandemic? And while trade, as, as Professor Sheffi said, is, has clearly been critical, um, trade policy was not particularly helpful, especially at the beginning when we so desperately needed um, the PPE. Um, the, you may recall, many of the, the listeners and watchers, I'm sure, are aware that, that President Trump had, um, you know, starting at roughly two years ago, this trade war with China and imposed unilateral tariffs against China over alleged unfair trade practices. Now, a lot of China's trading partners agreed that there were problems with how China conducts its, its trade policy. But by responding unilaterally, um, the U.S. triggered retaliation from China. We got into this tit-for-tat trade war. And when the pandemic hit early this year, we had 15 to 25 percent tariffs on a range of imports from China, including a number of critical items, hand sanitizers, thermometers, oxygen concentrators. Um, and on a lot, China is a major supplier of a lot of the PPE that was so desperately needed. And at least in those first critical weeks, we had these, these very high tariffs on those products. So that meant that we were at a disadvantage in trying to, to, to get those items from China. Now, eventually the administration did um, do exemptions for most of those items, um, but it was again, several weeks into the pandemic. And they're only temporary. So, you know, unless the Biden administration is going to have to very quickly act when it comes in next year to make sure that those tariffs remain uh, waived or hopefully just lifted. So in the midst of the, of the worst part of the pandemic, or at least in the first wave, trade policy um, was not helpful. Now going to your second question, sort of looking more broadly at supply chains and trade policy and COVID and how all of these things are likely to affect developing countries and their opportunities in the global system. Um, let me make uh, sort of a few points. But let me start by just sort of um, pointing out that sort of in the background of, of the immediate events, um, the supply chains, there's a lot of evidence, and I don't know if, if, if Yossi would agree or not, but a lot of people thinking that so the supply chain phenomenon was maturing. And so we were seeing trades, it was still growing after the Great Recession, but growing more slowly than it had been before and slower than global growth on average, um, in, with, in part at least because the fragmentation of trade that was part of that early supply chain phenomenon um, that led to such rapid growth in trade and, and you know, expanding opportunities for developing countries to engage in supply chains, that process had kind of played itself out. Not that supply chains were gonna remain stagnant or not gonna change or move or adjust, but simply that that level of growth, that level of trade growth that we had been seeing, we're not likely to see again. So that's something of a challenge for developing countries that the, the opportunities are gonna be maybe less than they were before. Um, then you have the pandemic coming in 
And you mentioned, you know, some of the, the ways that that has had those supply and demand shocks. Um, you know, some of the ways that that companies have, could respond um, is through accelerating again a trend that was already happening, which is automation. And in, in some cases, by adopting robots and other automation technologies more quickly than they might otherwise have, that could include some reshoring to the United States, Europe, and other advanced economies, and again, be more of a I'm sorry, can you hear Kim, me now? Yes. Okay, how long ago? <laughs> I, did, I don't know how I got muted, but um, where did you lose me? We heard till you were describing um, developing countries may not have as many opportunities, and then you were describing automation and reshoring. Okay, so that's okay. Um, I'll try and avoid hitting whatever I hit. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, um, so, so what I was going then to moving to was you had mentioned how changes in demand could affect supply chains and could affect um, developing countries. Um, there are many uh, economists looking at the post-COVID economy and projecting that, for example, we may all continue to do a lot more working from home, just like we're doing right now. Um, do a lot more telecommuting, a lot less driving in and working in an office environment. Um, that could mean, you know, lower sales of automobiles, um, either lower sales overall of apparel, if we're just hanging out in our t-shirts and sweats, or, or different kinds of apparel, those are things, those are supply chains where developing countries are very um, heavily involved. And so they could, there could be some adjustments. There's some lowering of demand that affects um, some of those countries involved in those. Um, and then when we come to trade policy, you know, I mentioned the, the um, trade war with China. Um, and as Yossi mentioned, you know, there was already been uh, movement of supply chains, especially on the labor intensive end. So things like, again, clothing, footwear, um, out of China because of rising wages and adjusting to what's going on in China even before all of this. There, both the, the combination of the shock of the pandemic and then again, the Trump tariffs um, have been accelerating that process. So that Vietnam, Bangladesh, the professor mentioned, have been beneficiaries in some of those supply chains from suppliers, uh, I'm sorry, buyers uh, looking to avoid the risk of being too concentrated in China. So that is something that's likely to continue and possibly accelerate. And then the final point um, is um, on sort of more broadly how this administration's trade policy is affecting sort of the global environment for developing countries and trade. And again, you know, beyond the China trade war, there have been um, tariffs on steel and aluminum and a number of other products that have directly, uh, in some cases, hit developing country suppliers and exporters. Um, but I think the biggest um, potential danger for developing countries is just the, the broader reversion in the US to unilateralism and the attacks on the World Trade Organization. And to some degree, I would expect the Biden administration to be more mobile, but it's gonna take a lot of time and effort to rebuild, for example, the, the dispute settlement system, which has been paralyzed by the Trump administration. Um, that's not gonna be easy to rebuild. The, the other problem is that, for example, those steel and aluminum tariffs, the administration used a national security authority to impose those tariffs, claiming that steel and aluminum imports we're undermining the national security of the United States. And if that kind of uh, approach to, or that, that the national security exemption approach um, was continued or was picked up by other countries and Japan used it in a trade war with Korea, you know, national security saying that you can put tariffs on sort of anything for national security reasons is a huge potential loophole in the international trade rules. So I think that undermining of international norms and of the dispute settlement at the WTO um, are big problems for developing countries because smaller, less powerful countries are the ones who are most dependent on having a rules-based system to keep trade more or less um, on, a, on an even basis. 
and a fair basis for all countries. So I'll stop there and I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thanks, Kim. And um, um, thanks for the patience um, in working with a, a a, a, a internet connection that wasn't always coming out very well, but we, we heard all, all, of, all of your comments um, well. And I think it's also a useful reminder that there are things that need to be changed in the global trade system in order for global supply chains uh, on one side for medical products, which are critical for the period of the pandemic, but also all other items that we trade on which uh, lives and livelihoods depend in many developing countries continue to to function and um, with that let me go to to Fred Hockford so Fred I enjoyed reading your book the six examples that you pick uh, of, of very simple to understand products but at the same time we realize that um, you know across the aisles in the US but also in multiple countries in the world trade isn't being accepted as something which is beneficial. And, you know, the pandemic on one side has reminded us how much do we depend on global trade to meet even basic needs uh, for medical products. But on the other hand, we have, uh, you know, started thinking more about nationalistic ways of organizing supply chains, cutting our ties and dependence on trade and saying, can we become self-reliant, uh, whether it's in the area of medicines or it's in the area of uh, PPE or many other products? So wanted to hear from you um, examples where you think this is not the right way of thinking about it and anything that you would like to um, add to what Kim said about trade policy going into the pandemic, which, um, which may not have helped us have a better response. Well, uh, thank you, Prashant, and uh, I, I enjoyed our other two panelists. I agree with so much what uh, uh, Yossi had to say, as well as uh, Kimberly. Um, uh, supply chains and, and commerce in general requires uh, more certainty. And the trade wars and the disruption in trade policy uh, certainly is not helpful for the smooth flow of trade uh, and the smooth flow of, um, it's particularly in the PPE area. And uh, one thing that uh, Professor Sheffi said, you know, at the beginning in January, you had to define PPE and look it up. It was personal protective equipment. And I too uh, spend some time in my book, uh, trade is not a full letter word, describing what a supply chain is. And now I don't have to describe it. People know what a, they know what a value chain is. They know what the supply chain is. I mean, it's quite remarkable how we have all become uh, so much more educated on this. Uh, that said, there's a lot of push uh, through the nationalism, I think, to try and say we need to reshore things and nationalize things. You know, uh, many years ago, we talked about a national security. Now people talk about food security, health security, water security, uh, energy security. Uh, we, we've become uh, somewhat obsessed with this globally. And when it comes to health security, I think uh, I, I totally agree with uh, Professor Sheffi. I mean, one of the things that was needed is a sufficient inventory uh, of materials. I think about in a very simplistic way, if there's going to be a bad hurricane or a tornado or some storm, uh, what do we do? We make sure we have enough food in the house. We make sure the car has gas. Um, and if we're going to have to travel, we think of alternate ways of traveling. We don't just say, well, maybe uh, I won't be able to use mass transit. I'll have to uh, hitch a ride or maybe I'll have to get a uh, try an alternate way of getting to work. So supply chains are really similar in that way. And so Partly, I think there's been a misunderstanding. I'm actually hopeful. Uh, I'm an optimistic person by nature. And I think that there is a greater understanding of that. Um, but that said, I think that um, there is probably going to have to be, you know, the term we hear a lot about right now is more resilient supply chains uh, so that they are perhaps not as fragile. But uh, again, I, I agree with uh, Professor Sheffi. I mean, 
supply chains have brought the cost down and people are very quick to say, oh, you know, I would spend more. But the fact of the matter is people don't spend more. You know, uh, if you look at uh, airline tickets, you know, people say, oh, I, you know, I would, I, people bargain hunt for the lowest possible. Uh, and, and that's just, I think, human nature in a capitalist society. So uh, I'm a little skeptical that we're going to be able to add cost as part of that resiliency and that the market will fully accept it. But I think there are ways that certainly, as I mentioned at the beginning, national security, water security, health security, there's going to be a need to say there needs to be certain requirements, certain uh, protocols and norms in place to make sure that uh, uh, we don't run out of vital equipment. One thing I would just add, when you mentioned trade policy, there's one area the Republicans and Democrats in our country seem to agree on, and that is about China. But uh, China has been able to unite Democrats and Republicans in a way that I don't know many other issues have actually united uh, two opposite parties in our country. Yeah, thanks, Fred. So um, thanks for um, laying it out in, in, in very simple and easy to understand ways as to how do we need to create backup options and, and resiliency in, in supply chains. I think um, a, a pending question continues to be, um, should, we, should we think about geographical diversification as a necessary step in supply chain resilience, and by geographical diversification, I mean not being over dependent on one region or one geography and spreading our our uh, supply bases, especially for critical supplies where security is indeed important. And in doing so, we may have a secondary benefit or a lanyard that we may help additional countries which are not well integrated into global supply chains today, whether they are in Latin America, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in some parts of South Asia, which are not as integrated, and that will also help us in our uh, on our aid and development agenda, in some ways. So, any quick thoughts you have around this? And uh, meanwhile, I want to encourage our participants to send questions. You can send them through Twitter at CGDev, um, at CGD Talks hashtag, or you can send them by email to events at CGDev, or you can submit them through YouTube. So keep the questions coming. We'll, we'll move to your questions in a minute, but um, back to you, Fred. Well, uh, uh, two quick thoughts I have. One is that it is difficult. China has developed a wonderful ecosystem to help supply things. So that is not that easy to replicate. But um, that said, you know, you mentioned when I worked uh, in the Clinton administration, I was at the Small Business Administration. And one of the things we had to do there was provide a disaster assistance when there was a bad hurricane or a tornado or, or uh, bad storms. And we actually ran four different disaster review, uh, disaster response centers around the country for exactly that reason. We could not have one central one because it could get knocked out. So by having four, and similar to what uh, uh, Professor Sheffy said, we had a core of people who were on call. When there was a disaster, they were on call and we would bring them in. And if we need to, we dispatch them around the country. Um, so having a little more nuance around that. And to give you one other example, you know, with a lot of uh, thought about nationalizing and bringing things back, this health crisis required ventilators. The next health crisis may not require ventilators. So having a, as you mentioned, Prashant, a more diversified uh, supply chain that looks around the world and that we can, not just the United States, but other countries can tap into when there's a crisis is vitally important. This was a highly, highly unusual pandemic in that it, had, it attacked or addressed the entire world virtually simultaneously. Uh, that is not normally the case, but having something that's diversified uh, makes that difference. And I'll give you one other small example I was thinking about uh, listening again to um, Professor Sheffy when uh, I was in business. I ran a company called Lily and Vernon and we did a lot of importing from China and, and we worked on, on just in time. But what we actually did is we had an intermediate stop in Hong Kong, which was the quality control center. And we made sure that the goods were in met our standards before they got on a ship to come to America versus waiting 45 days to get to America and then discovering there was a problem. So there are many ways of addressing this issue and they're not 
uh, that uh, rocket science, we have to simply be more innovative and we have to just think creatively. And I think some of the ideas that have come out so far on this panel are in the right direction. Thank you, Fred. And uh, I think I'm facing similar challenges as Kim. My uh, network bandwidth is falling. But uh, let the questions keep coming uh, to all, all of you who are participating in this uh, through different channels, um, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, a couple of questions that have, uh, have come to us, one of which is, um, do you think the pandemic will, will lead to skipping technology steps in developing country supply chains where they would, in a way, leapfrog to new kind of supply chain tools um, which it took industrialized countries much longer to adopt. And if yes, what, where do you think the most exciting potential for something like this is? So let me start with Yossi and then I'll come to Fred and, and Kim. Yossi, you're muted. I was just trying to see if you can read lips. Obviously you cannot. So, uh... I was just saying that next time start with somebody, somebody else. But <laughs> anyway, um, what was the question again about the uh, leaping, leaping? Okay, you, we all look at the example of uh, cell phone and uh, you know mobile payment as a, as a way to leap technologies, and um, they've been accepted, you know, um, in many developing countries. I'm not sure one very important technology that will help developing country get into the game, aside from the obvious of uh, you know, education and, and capabilities building, is being able to, uh, to track things, visibility. Because I want to know when stuff leaves you know, Laos in Nigeria, or Stam lives, you know, uh, somewhere else in, uh, in Africa or in, uh, in South America. I want to know several things. First of all, I want to know that it got on the vehicle, where the vehicle is, how long it will take to get to the port, what's, the, what's right now the congestion at the port, when can I expect it, is something happening? This is something that will happen because there's a lot of new sensor technology that's being developed as we speak that will allow this, um, this to happen. It will require, and, and it, it will not even require, that's where the jump in technology, it will not even require total, uh, wife, total uh, cellular coverage. It will, uh, it, a lot of it goes satellite, so, uh, so they'll be there and help supply chain. In one of the more vexing problem, that all supply chain have, and this is having visibility in what's coming, especially what's coming into the plant when we have a, uh, we have a plant. So that's one thing I can think of. Fred, any examples that come to mind? Well, uh, a little bit further afield, but uh, you know, this week uh, two movie studios announced that they will be releasing films directly on sort of home viewing streaming services as well as in movie theaters. I mean, that is leapfrogging uh, in, a, in a way a supply chain of entertainment services that normally you'd have to go to a movie theater and perhaps six, eight, 10, 90 days later, you might be able to stream uh, first quote unquote first run movies at home. So I think that the pandemic in some ways has changed that, that distribution channel which is in some way a supply chain. So I think that is certainly uh, an immediate one that came to mind, uh, partly you know, a little bit for outside of the, the, the strict confines of a supply chain, but it is one of the ways that we receive entertainment and uh, information today. So that, yeah, and that's and clearly one. Hopefully, um, Fred, that will also increase the opportunities for content to be generated and sourced from a more diversified content creation supply base, right? So instead of all of our content coming from um, Los Angeles, California, and, it could and be in, coming and, from and around India. the world. And, and India. India. And India. Um, Let's not forget be, India. Yeah, so um, Hollywood and Bollywood, um, I mean, and, and Nollywood and lots of other places could create content and it becomes much easier to distribute that and that way 
the entertainment industry but, creates but, greater livelihood around the world. But Prashant, the making making of the content is not simple at all. It's a very high tech today you know, operation that requires a lot of professionals. And the reason that it works in Hollywood and Bollywood is because there's cluster of people with the right, uh, right ability, technologies and all this. So it will have to be developed just like any other supplier of, of, of goods anywhere else. Yeah, so hopefully in addition to the two or three clusters of know-how, new clusters may emerge because at least the cost of distributing content has come down. So yes, we'll still need the, the know-how to create content. Okay, let me go to Kim and see if, Kim, do you have examples or things you think will be uh, skipping technology steps in developing countries, which the pandemic has amplified? I don't, that, I, I don't know that I do have any additional examples, but what I was thinking is, as you all were discussing the question, is just, um, you know, one of the, the areas that has has been sort of least engaged in the supply chains is Africa. And in Africa, I think it's, you know, it's really an issue of, of two things. One, just getting even up to grade with a lot of the existing technologies be potentially before leapfrogging, although there's been some discussion of, you know, on the cell phone, sort of skipping landlines and going straight to cell phones, which would have many advantages in Africa and other underdeveloped places. And, but the second thing being, um, I think for Africa to, to really uh, get into this game um, in a big way it would mean accelerating the African Continental Free Trade Agreement idea and getting much more um, regional integration. We're seeing that now in Asia. I mean, it was already a very integrated region, but they've just signed this regional comprehensive economic partnership agreement that binds together all of the 10 countries of ASEAN with China, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, India opted out of that. But so you see this, the integration, which I think is very important to facilitating this, these flexible supply chains, um, not happening as much in South Asia, not happening as much in Africa. And so there, I think you still have a big role for trade policies, um, you know, leading towards more integration but also domestic policies to make sure that those internal barriers to transportation and communication um, come down much more than they have to date. Prasad, I yeah, thanks, Kim. Oh. No, go ahead, go ahead, Fred. Something that Kim said earlier, which I think, I believe Kim, Kim said it, oh, I'm attributing it there. There is gonna be, there is greater and greater automation. And there is, uh, in some ways, uh, that will be some reshoring of certain manufacturing that you can get, you know, uh, sneakers could be customized. And uh, so you might have a, a plant that automates that that might be right near a UPS hub or a FedEx hub. So uh, one of my concerns is that um, some of the sort of low labor cost supply chains that were available in Southeast Asia for clothing, garments, and so forth, uh, are less likely to be available for Sub-Saharan Africa to replicate that. Uh, and so that, that playbook that uh, Bangladesh, Vietnam and others have been able to do, Sri Lanka for clothing and garments may not really be available um, the way it was for those countries. And so they're gonna have to, places like Sub-Saharan Africa will have to sort of think through other ways of uh, providing an income and building up the GDP and the standard of living in those countries. I think that's going to be harder, frankly, in the next decade uh, let than me it just, was in the last decade. Let me just add here uh, that right now, China has well over a third of the world robots playing. China is, being, is getting to be automated a lot faster than any other country. Now, that's may be a problem for the Chinese. They'll have labor force with no <laughs> problem. And in China, it will bring social issues and government. There's a lot of other, a host of other issues that may come in China, but they're racing towards robotics and automation at a really fast clip, which means that it's, and, and they're investing in it, they're getting better at it. It's not clear that uh, manufacturing elsewhere will be able to compete. It's not only labor cost that's a uh, right. you know factor of production. They're getting it's know-how. It's uh, you know of course 
uh, investments already there and using it anyway. Yeah, so I have a question for Kim. This is um, John Hicklin is asking, um, I mean, this is exactly in the lines of what you said about the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, the new, um, the new uh, trade pact in Asia, that while we have a lot more caution in the U.S., um, Asia um, and, and other regions are, are seeing a greater desire to think about multilateral initiatives. So what do you think are the prospects of returning to greater multilateral cooperation uh, and then a similar question, how do we make sure that such cooperation continues back on when the crisis ends? Well, I think that the, the change in administration will at least um, rhetorically and symbolically um, overall, um, approaches, more cooperative approaches. Um, President-elect Biden has said, for example, that when it comes to China, even though he shares some of the concerns of this administration about China, he thinks that a, a, a broader cooperative approach with our allies in Europe and elsewhere would be more helpful in getting China um, to embrace reform. So, so I definitely think that there will be in terms of the sort of broad approach, be more multilateral, more cooperative. I hope that one of the first things that the, uh, the new president will do is to lift the veto on, on a new WTO uh, director general, which the, the Trump administration did just in October, just before the election, and, and you know, join the consensus around uh, Ngozi Onjo Kawela. I'm sorry, I messed up her name. I don't have it written in front of me. Um, but anyway, I think she'd be an excellent director general of the WTO, and hopefully that can get moving very quickly. That would not take, you know, any effort, any any real political capital to do that. Um, beyond that, I do think that trade, you know, we're still going to be in a very bad phase of the pandemic. That's clearly going to be the priority. Um, the domestic economic situation and jobs and unemployment in the U.S. I think is going to be a priority. I think trade policy is going to be um, a much lower priority, um, you know, in 2021, possibly even 2022. So I, ex I, I expect a, a much more favorable environment under the next administration. Um, I would hope that um, not just on the environment and, and in you know, climate change and some other areas where uh, President-elect Biden has said he's going to undo some of the negative things that have happened in the last few years. Um, I hope that will also come to some of the trade actions, lifting some of the tariffs that are damaging the U.S. economy. Um, but some real, but I think in terms of a broader, you know, I don't think that going out and negotiating new trade agreements or launching major trade negotiations with the WTO are likely to be a priority. So I think that's going to be a little bit further down the line. Thanks, Kim. And I have a question for, for Fred. So I think uh, a lot of discussion concentrated around um, how do we get supply disruptions, how do we, uh, how do we manage supply disruptions by uh, you know, getting product in quickly, managing logistics better. Uh, most of what we heard in the global management of the pandemic were multilateral development banks playing a role in, in lending. Uh, but we know that trade credit is an extremely important part um, to keep the supply chain machinery and the trade machinery running. And um, you know, given that you you um, led the U.S. Exim Bank and also um, you know other banks like this, such as the Afra Exim Bank or other <clears throat> Exim banks in other regions, we haven't seen them at the forefront of the discussion around supply chain disruptions as much. Uh, is that because we, we just are, have an information blind spot or is it that they haven't taken such a you know, mainstream role in smoothing trade credit and making supply chains work better? Uh, well, that's a good question. I think that partly it's often just under the radar. Uh, one of the things we developed um, after the global financial crisis at the U.S. Export Import Bank was supply chain finance because 
uh, a, a way that makes sure the supply chains would be have adequate liquidity um, and not have to wait, say, 60, 90 or more to get paid. Um, we put that product in place, uh, but frankly, the, the, finan- the private sector actually quickly filled in and there was less of a need. And But the good news is during this crisis, that financial product was uh, re- uh, in, uh, initiated or reintroduced uh, and is also being used today. So I think that my hunch is it's just sort of, it doesn't get the high profile of some of the other exports. Um, but I know that last time, uh, at least when I was at the Export Input Bank, you know, we would meet, um, uh, we had met uh, G7 members of the uh, uh, global economy would meet. And I'm sorry to say we had a G11 because we added four of the other countries that had very robust uh, export input banks uh, as well, to countries like India, Korea, and, uh, and so forth. Um, but so I'm not exactly uh, as up to date on what they are precisely doing now, but usually it was just didn't get the high profile. Okay, good. So we have about three minutes left. Um, I want to go back to each of you uh, with one question as uh, a closing remark. Uh, your outlook on things that will change um, post-COVID in supply chains, trade, trade policy, some of which you've covered. But if you were to say, here is my wish list of what can change, and here is where my pragmatic hat tells me this one is, is going to change. So let me start with, with you, Fred. Uh, I would say the major change I think we're going to see in the United States is a greater focus on workers and how uh, workers and uh, people and employment levels and jobs are impacted by trade. I think that perhaps one can argue that consumers and companies um, had a much bigger say in the past. Obviously, they all are into, they're all linked, but I think there's gonna be appropriately and it's timely a greater emphasis on workers. Thank you, Kim. Well, let me just um, agree with what Fred just said and, and then expand to say that I think that, that I, I, that I agree with an emphasis on investing in U.S. Competitiveness, competitiveness as a better way to deal with U.S. trade challenges than putting on tariffs and closing borders and taking care of our business here at home that I think is what lays the groundwork for an open trade policy that we can continue to be open to the rest of the world and to continue to help uh, developing countries to engage in supply chains and and become more competitive and use trade uh, to stimulate their growth. Thanks. Yossi. Oh, there's so many, so many issues. I, and, you know, I wrote a lot about my fear that sustainability will take a significant, you know, will get back in the list of priorities of companies, government, uh, uh, consumers, whatever. But let me tell, say one word about trade because respond to what Kim and, and, and Fred said. I don't expect it to, to become, to be much better. In fact, uh, I expect some things to get to be worse. I wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal said the Chinese should fear Biden presidency because they could deal with Trump. Trump, you know, took the US itself without anybody else and try to uh, to deal with the Chinese. They responded. They are now a thriving economy. They, they, they are laughing at us. But if a Biden administration will be able to unite the EU, Europe, and, and some other countries and, you know, look at China collectively, I think the Chinese will have to pay much more attention to this and the, unfortunately, the first reaction being, being who they are, as nationalistic as they are, will be to try to hit back. So in the short term, I expect the trade will suffer. They may hit back around the world, not, not just you know, China, US. So, but long term, I think this is absolutely the right approach, which I wish would have taken right from the start. And they may bring us reasonable trade with China without IP theft and forced technology transfers. Yeah, thank you. So I want to firstly thank all of our uh, panelists, uh, Yossi, Fred, Kim, thank you so much. 
Uh, I want to close in the note that at the Center for Global Development, we focus on global development and trade and global supply chains are uh, very tightly connected with the global development agenda. So while some of the issues we talked about here may sound like they are too focused on U.S. trade policy, but uh, in a way this has impact on how we think about um, lives and livelihoods in countries around the world because of the interconnected nature of global supply chains and trade. Uh, thank you very much to all of you for joining, and once again, thank you to the panelists.